Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to go ahead and start today's webinar titled Life on the Brink, Anorexia Nervosa and Lethality. A few things to note, participants will be muted upon entry and videos turned off. For technical assistance, we ask that you use the chat box located at the bottom of your screen. Third, you will also receive an email approximately one month requesting feedback and impact on today's presentation. Also immediately following the webinar, you will receive an email with today's slides and an evaluation form. We also ask that you visit us at www.ncdus.org forward slash training to view other training opportunities that NC provides. As a reminder, this training will be recorded and available via the NC Training Center one week from today. We will reserve 10 minutes after the presentation for question and answers. I'll now introduce today's speaker, Dr. Tanya Foreman. Dr. Foreman graduated from the University of Kentucky College of Medicine. She did an adult psychiatry residency at Vanderbilt University in Child and Adolescent Psychiatry Fellowship at the University of Florida and a Forensic Psychiatry Fellowship at Yale University. She has been on the medical school faculties at Tulane University, University of Louisville, Indiana University, and is currently a professor of clinical psychiatry at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. She has won numerous awards, including the Ginsburg Fellowship from the Group for the Advancement of Psychiatry and the Rappaport Fellowship from the American Academy of Psychiatry and the Law. I'll now turn things over to Dr. Tanya Foreman. Hi there. I was asked to give a talk about suicide and anorexia, but I realized that it's extremely difficult to separate the suicidality from the mood symptoms that are often part of anorexia nervosa. This is also complicated by the fact that we might have serious concerns about a patient's risk of dying from medical complications from their anorexia nervosa, but the patient doesn't appreciate the risk of death. Therefore, I have included lethality in the talk rather than just anorexia and suicide. Lachelle, I'm having trouble advancing. Um, let's see. Could you click your arrow button and see that? Yeah, allows I'm doing you arrow. Hang on. Nothing is happening when I do arrow. Let's see if maybe you take, okay. That, I don't know why that worked, but that okay. worked. Okay, it okay. sounds there we go. Okay. Okay. This talk is geared primarily toward primary care clinicians and mental health care clinicians. I hope it will be clinically useful as well as provide evidence-based interventions for treating depression and suicidality in patients with anorexia nervosa. So here's a roadmap of what we will discuss. We'll review the diagnostic criteria for anorexia nervosa, as well as statistics regarding suicide and anorexia nervosa. We will talk about the emotional consequences of starvation as demonstrated in the Minnesota Starvation Study. We'll take a look at a sample case. We will talk about the Connecticut statute regarding involuntary hospitalization. We will identify various levels of treatment and pros and cons of each, and we will review symptoms, including suicidal ideation, that can occur as an exacerbation of eating disorder treatment. We'll also review management strategies for distress reduction during treatment. We'll review evidence-based medication management strategies, and we will review evidence regarding ECT, TMS, and ketamine in patients with anorexia. And finally, 
I'll describe severe and enduring anorexia nervosa and discuss the controversy surrounding the appropriateness of palliative care, hospice, or medical aid in dying for some individuals. Here's a quick review of the DSM-5 criteria for anorexia nervosa. Restriction of food relative to the requirements leading to a significantly low body weight for age, sex, developmental trajectory, and physical health. The person must have an intense fear of gaining weight or becoming fat, even though they are underweight. And there's a disturbance in the way in which one's body weight or shape is experienced, undue influence of body weight or shape on self-evaluation, or denial of the seriousness of the current low body weight. You might recall that previous versions of the DSM-5 required that the patient be less than 85% of ideal body weight and have amenorrhea to qualify for a diagnosis of anorexia nervosa, but those requirements are no longer present. Suicide is the second most common cause of death in people with anorexia nervosa. The first most common cause is medical complications from the anorexia itself. Multiple studies find high rates of suicide in patients with anorexia nervosa. Suicide is estimated to be the cause of nearly half of the deaths in people with anorexia nervosa, and approximately 17% of people with anorexia attempt suicide at some point. Patients with binge behavior as part of their anorexia are more likely to attempt suicide. Suicide attempts in patients with anorexia nervosa were also associated with substance abuse, impulsivity, cluster B personality disorder traits, panic disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, as well as eating disorder severity. Suicide attempts are more common in patients with bulimia nervosa, but completed suicide rates are higher in anorexia nervosa. This is a little bit counterintuitive, um, but that's what I found in the literature. Depression can precede the eating disorder, co-occur with it, or be secondary to it, and suicidal ideation can occur at any time. Certainly, there are patients for whom anorexia and mood symptoms are separate. Not everybody with anorexia is depressed. Sometimes when you take a patient's history, it's clear that the episodes of depression predated or are separate and distinct from the anorexia. But for many patients, it becomes a chicken or the egg question. The evolution of the mood symptoms, suicidality, and anorexia are intertwined. Starvation itself can cause mood changes and impulsivity. Don't underestimate the physiological mood changes that can occur in patients with eating disorders. I want to introduce you to the Minnesota Starvation Study. The information from this study provided much, provides much of what we know about the physiological consequences of starvation. The investigator on the study was Dr. Ansel Keys, and it occurred during World War II in 1945. The participants in the study were 36 men, all of whom were conscientious subjectors during the war. They weren't draft dodgers, they were men who generally, for religious reasons, didn't want to fight in combat, but they wanted to do something to contribute to the war effort. So they enrolled in this study to learn more about the effects of starvation. The study was a year long and included six months of partial starvation. These are the Participants, their average age is 25, their average height was 5 feet 10 inches tall, and their average weight was 152 pounds. It just happened that the weight was slightly leaner for their height than the population at large. That wasn't by design. It just turned out that this was a pretty lean group of men. None of them had a premorbid eating disorder. So the outline of the study is that there were three months of starvation during which each man was brought to his normal weight for his height and build. A goal of this period was to determine the number of calories necessary for weight maintenance given a constant activity level. So they all had to walk like 22 miles a week or something, quite a bit of physical activity. Another goal was to establish baseline values for the various tests that were performed during the subsequent phases. After the control phase, there were six months of semi-starvation. Each man's diet was cut roughly in half with the ultimate goal of approximately 25% total body weight loss. 
Dr. Keyes didn't believe that the 25% weight loss would cause overly serious health consequences, but he thought it would be significant enough to produce measurable biological and emotional changes for the study. And then the final three months were a rehabilitation period with subjects broken into subgroups to test recovery diets containing different amounts of calorie, proteins, and vitamins. Keyes thought this would be helpful during the massive relief effort that was anticipated at the end of the war. And basically he wanted to find out whether there was an optimal refeeding diet for a starved person. The participants were subjected to many medical and psychological evaluations during the study. They had blood tests, urine tests, semen analysis, and x-rays. They also took psychological tests, including the newly developed MMPI, or Minnesota Multiphysic Personality Inventory. They did treadmill tests to the point of exhaustion. The goal was for each participant to lose approximately two and a half pounds per week. The amount of food each man received depended on how he was progressing toward his weekly weight loss goal. In order to lose approximately two and a half pounds, week, pounds per week, or 25% of the total body weight in six months, participants were fed approximately 1,560 calories per day. This number is shocking to me. If you think about many common weight loss diets now, people eat far fewer than 1,500 calories a day. But 1,560 calories in this study was enough to cause negative physical and emotional consequences for participants. In our current diet culture, we have completely lost sight of how damaging it is to restrict calories, yet people continue to do it in the name of health. We don't have time to review all the findings from the study, but I do wanna talk about some of the emotional effects of starvation. What we learned from the Minnesota multiphase or from the Minnesota starvation study is that many of the participants develop similar emotional responses to what we see in patients with anorexia nervosa. Subjects reported decreased ambition and social motivation. They had difficulty making decisions. They were irritable. Participants in the study reported decreased libido and decreased interest in dating. They had nightmares. One man even dreamed about cannibalism. This is a dexterity test. During the starvation phase, cognitive abilities decreased. People had poor concentration. They had more trouble sitting through required classes. When they repeated the MMPI, most of the study participants had higher deviations on the neurotic scale after six months of starvation than they did at the beginning of the study. They had low mood. They were obsessed with food and found little joy in anything else. This is Sam Legg, one of the participants in the study. As the study progressed, he demonstrated increasingly unusual behavior. He started collecting cookbooks and reading recipes. He stared at pictures of food with pornographic interest. He was agitated in the meal lines. When a cafeteria worker dropped a serving spoon and had to go back to the kitchen to get another one, Legg started smashing his tray on the counter and swearing. He had previously been an unofficial leader of the group and the other participants became worried about his deterioration. At mealtime, Leg combined all of the food on his plate into a pile. He then put so much salt and pepper on it that it was crusty with seasoning and ate it. Here's Mr. Leg again. At one point in the study, he dropped a car on his hand while he pretended to do some maintenance and he crushed a finger. Doctors were suspicious but allowed him to remain in the study. He also befriended some elderly women during one of his required walks, and he went to visit them one day while they were eating. He couldn't eat the meal, but he enjoyed the company, so he hung out in the yard for a while. While they ate, he went outside to chop wood. He was chopping wood and heard people laughing and scraping their plates inside. He imagined slicing through meat. As he chopped through wood, he put his left hand on the flat top of the log and cut off three of his fingers. Ansel Keys went to see Mr. Legg in the hospital to kick him out of the study, but Mr. Legg begged to stay in the study and said, keep me in for the hungry. For the rest of my life, people are going to ask me what I did during the war. This experiment is my chance to give an honorable answer to the question. So he was allowed to remain in the study. When asked later whether the incident had been an accident or not, Legg said that he could not say that it was and he could not say that it was not. 
If you're interested in learning more about the Minnesota Starvation Study, I highly recommend this book. It's well-researched, it has a lot of colorful details, it reads like a novel, and it was the source for much of the information that I just presented about the Minnesota Starvation Study. Risk evaluation of patients with anorexia nervosa is more difficult than other risk assessments because the eating disorder itself creates a wild card. As evidenced by Mr. Leg cutting off his fingers, I've seen many patients with eating disorders who are so consumed by their anorexia that they're unreasonable. As a clinician, it's important to keep in mind that a patient who previously has been reliable, predictable, and compliant might become more dangerous to themselves when they're in the throes of anorexia nervosa. Anorexia is a disease of shame and secrecy. Therefore, don't assume that patients with anorexia will tell you the extent of their eating disorder behaviors or the extent of potential suicidal ideation. Particularly if a patient is quite a low body weight or they have lost a precipitous amount of weight in a short period of time, their reports about their behaviors or their mental state become increasingly unreliable. Let's take a look at this case study. Annie is a 22-year-old cis female with a BMI of 12. She has a history of anorexia nervosa and has previously required inpatient hospitalization for bradycardia. She's lost 30 pounds in the last two months. She comes to see you for a refill on her birth control pills. Annie's mother accompanies her to the appointment and voices concern that Annie's anorexia is out of control again. Annie reports that she is depressed and feels hopeless. She's been isolating herself in her room and only comes out to exercise. She says she's not actively suicidal, but she doesn't see the point of living. She says she doesn't care if she doesn't wake up tomorrow. On exam, Annie has a heart rate of 35 and a blood pressure of 86 over 42. She admits that she has only consumed a glass of water and a boiled egg in the last 24 hours. When you suggest that she needs inpatient treatment, Annie becomes angry and says, I'm not going and there's nothing you can do about it. I'll kill myself if you try to make me fat. What are your options as a clinician? Obviously, this is a complicated case with many nuances, and there's not necessarily a right or wrong answer, but let's consider some of the options. One possible option is to send Annie to the emergency department for medical uh, evaluation. However, if she goes to the ED, they might send her away because they might not realize the severity of the eating disorder. Or if her labs are normal, they might not realize how potentially ill she is. Let's take a quick little detour to talk about the potential medical lethality in a patient like Annie and what might happen if you send her to the ED. First, let's talk about the bradycardia. Here's why bradycardia is worrisome in a patient like this. Patients with extremely low heart rates are at risk to develop aberrant heart rhythms, especially at night when the heart rate is likely to go down anyway. My rule of thumb is that any patient with anorexia and a pulse of 40 or less needs to be on telemetry for at least a few days. If they can't be on telemetry, I want them to be evaluated by a cardiologist who's willing to sign off that they're stable not to be on telemetry. Sometimes, though, bradycardia in these patients gets dismissed as, oh, they're just an athlete. Here's a way to help determine if the bradycardia is secondary to a highly conditioned heart, like you would see in an athlete. It's true that some athletes have low heart rates. When that athlete walks across the room or does mild physical movement, their heart rate doesn't increase much because their heart is extremely efficient. Someone with bradycardia secondary to anorexia, however, might have bradycardia while sitting, but their heart rate would be likely to jump 20 or 30 or even 40 points when they do something as simple as walk across the room. This is because their heart is deconditioned. It is braided down to try to preserve precious energy, but when a small demand is placed on the body, the heart has to race to catch up to send blood throughout the body. But sometimes clinicians erroneously attribute the positional change impulse to dehydration, but it is often because of cardiac deconditioning. Another consideration is that aggressive fluid resuscitation in this type of patient is dangerous because they can't handle rapidly increased volume. 
Another consideration is that people can be extremely ill with anorexia and have completely normal labs. In fact, abnormal labs are probably the exception rather than the rule. If someone is purging, they're more likely to have hypokalemia or hyperamylycemia, but for someone who only restricts, their labs are likely to be completely normal, and then this can confound the difficulty of getting them admitted from the emergency department. A potential con of sending her to the ED is that if the ED doesn't admit her, it could undermine your efforts to get her to understand the potential lethality of her eating disorder. It would address your duty to get her treatment, but it might kind of undermine the relationship. That's probably not a reason not to send her to the ED if that's what you think needs to happen, but it can certainly be a negative outcome if Annie doesn't get admitted. And I've had many patients tell me they went to the emergency room and were told they're fine and they can go home. This can be very dangerous in a patient who might be medically precarious secondary to her eating disorder or in the person whose mental status and mood might worsen secondary to her severe anorexia nervosa. Well, can you hospitalize Annie involuntarily? This is an area of a lot of confusion, and the answer is yes. This is the Connecticut Involuntary Commitment Statute, and it permits the involuntary commitment of people with psychiatric illness who are either dangerous to themselves or others or gravely disabled. A Gravely disabled person is defined as someone who may suffer serious harm because he fails to provide for his basic human needs and refuses to accept necessary hospitalization. So eating disorder would fit under that. So even if the person with anorexia nervosa does not endorse active suicidal ideation, you can involuntarily hospitalize them under the Connecticut statute. I practice in North Carolina and our law is similar and I've successfully involuntary hospitalized patients for anorexia nervosa here. Sometimes the judge or magistrate ultimately allows that patient to leave the hospital before I think they're ready, but sometimes they don't. And I feel like I've done my duty by exercising the right to involuntary hospitalize somebody whose judgment is grossly impaired secondary to their anorexia nervosa. So let's talk about some of the uh, levels of care that people with anorexia nervosa can have. First, there's inpatient treatment. Inpatient treatment might occur on a medical or pediatric unit, a general psychiatric unit, or a specialty eating disorder unit. Residential treatment is probably not appropriate for someone who is uh, acutely suicidal unless it's a locked facility compliant with JCO requirements regarding ligaments and other safety hazards. Some residential treatment programs are secure in that way, but many are not. Many residential treatment programs are in homes or in more cozy structures, and those places would not be appropriate for somebody who's acutely suicidal. Then these are some alternatives to 24 seven treatment. However, in the case of somebody who is medically unstable or acutely suicidal, they wouldn't be appropriate, but I included the slide so you'd be familiar with the terms. PHP or partial hospitalization program is basically day treatment where patients go to the treatment facility for six or more hours a day. Intensive outpatient programs or IOP usually meet three or more days per week, often in the evenings for just a few hours. And a benefit of IOPs is that often patients can continue to go to school or work while they go to IOP. But again, this wouldn't be appropriate for someone who is suicidal or medically unstable. And then finally, there's outpatient treatment. So I want to acknowledge that often we place patients on certain types of units because there's no alternative. In addition, many of the issues facing a patient with life-threatening anorexia nervosa or suicidal ideation straddle the line between medicine and psychiatry. So as I talk about levels of care and monitoring, the type of patient I have in mind is someone whose anorexia puts their life at risk due to active or passive suicidality or impaired judgment secondary to the anorexia itself or someone with potentially life-threatening medical complications of the anorexia nervosa itself. And this type of patient doesn't fit neatly on a medical or psychiatric binary. 
So going back to the inpatient levels of care and the potentially suicidal patient with anorexia nervosa, let's think about the type of monitoring that's available at various levels of care on different units. First, there's an inpatient medical or pediatric unit. Hospitalization on an inpatient medical or peds unit would generally have a patient in a traditional hospital room and rooms on medical or peds floors are not locked. They're not secure against suicide risks and they don't provide the safety that a suicidal patient needs. Therefore, they would have to be on one-to-one. -one. So what are the potential benefits of inpatient medical pediatric hospitalization for a patient like Annie? First, sometimes this is the unit that is clearly necessary for someone who's medically unstable and no other unit would be appropriate because the patient might need IV fluids, telemetry, or IV electrolyte repletion. In addition, access to specialty medical or even surgical consultation can occur easily from a medical or pediatric unit. There should be easy access to stat labs, x-rays, and other imaging and other diagnostic procedures. Access to that type of service can often be limited in non-medical settings. Another potential benefit of hospitalizing a patient like Annie on a medical unit is that it might be easier to persuade her to be admitted to a medical unit than to a psychiatric unit. If she's having GI or other physical complaints that need additional diagnostic testing, it might be easier to persuade her to be admitted to medicine while a workup or stabilization occurs. What are the potential limitations of medical or pediatric hospitalization? One potential limitation is that the staff on these units might not have much experience treating eating disorders and it's easy to say something that is well-meaning but is triggering to patients. So for example, most patients would be pleased to be told that they look healthier today. However, for a patient with anorexia nervosa, they would automatically think you look fat if a patient tells them they look better. One-to-one -one sitters often have no mental health experience and they're not likely to have eating disorder experience. In some facilities, the one-to-one -one literally is just a person that sits by the patient to make sure they don't attempt suicide or elope. The one-to-one -one might not feel or be empowered to intervene if a patient purges or exercises. They're not likely to be trained to provide meal coaching. They're unlikely to detect more subtle eating disorder behaviors such as smearing food or hiding food. The one-to-one -one probably won't be able to do narrative documentation that reflects eating disorder behaviors, so the clinician won't be able to collect quality data about mealtime behaviors. Since one-to-ones usually have no eating disorder experience, they might engage in inappropriate food talk. For example, the sitter might make comments about dieting or exercise. They might allow the patient to watch an appropriate program, such as The Biggest Loser. They might not intervene if the patient accesses inappropriate social media sites, such as ProAnna or ProMia sites. As an aside, if you're not familiar with ProAnna or ProMia sites, they are websites that glamorize eating disorders, and basically people go there to praise each other or to seek advice about how to have a worse eating disorder. It's, they're really horrifying sites. Other potential limitations of med or peds units. Typically, these units don't offer group or individual psychotherapy. Some hospital units, especially peds units, have excellent eating disorder protocols, but others don't. It might be challenging on some of these units even to get daily weights, much less blinded, gowned, post void weights. The unit dietitian might not know how to help a patient with an eating disorder develop a meal plan and make food selections. The patient is unlikely to receive psychoeducation about the eating disorder or have an idea about what treatment beyond the hospital could entail. Case managers on general medical or pediatric units are unlikely to be familiar with aftercare resources for patients with anorexia nervosa. Having family members at the bedside can be helpful or detrimental depending on the situation. If the family has enabled the eating disorder or is highly enmeshed with a patient, having them at the bedside can present challenges. I remember transferring a woman in her 20s to our eating disorder unit from the medical floor. When I went to visit her on the medical floor, her mother was literally sleeping in the hospital bed with her. 
So if hospitalization on a medical or pediatric unit is not indicated, what are the pros and cons of hospitalizing a patient like Annie on a general psychiatric unit? On the plus side, psychiatric units are designed to provide an environment that protects patients with suicidal ideation. Staff are trained to watch for potentially dangerous behaviors. Doors are usually locked, belongings are searched, and visitors are monitored. There's less probability of having contraband on the unit. However, I will tell you an anecdote. On the unit where I work, which is a specialized psychiatric eating disorder unit in a hospital, people can occasionally sneak in contraband even though all the belongings are checked. One time, the friend of a patient on our unit stuffed laxatives inside a teddy bear and sent the bear to the hospital as a gift. Unwittingly, the patient's mother delivered the bear and we let the patient have the bear. Little did we know that we had just given her dozens of laxative pills. Another potential benefit of being on a general psychiatric unit is that involuntary hospitalization procedures can be implemented easily if needed. There are challenges to being on a psychiatric unit though. First, whether we like to admit it or not, there is a stigma associated with psychiatric units. I've known many patients who could more easily accept, I'm sorry, many parents who could more easily accept that their child has a serious gastrointestinal condition that requires hospitalization on a pediatric unit than to accept that their child has an eating disorder, a psychiatric condition. Psychiatric units are scary. If you haven't been on one in a while, they are not warm and fuzzy. As increased safeguards are put in place to prevent suicide in the hospital, psychiatric units have, been, have become even less hospitable. The furniture is institutional, minimal decorations are allowed, activities that could be good coping strategies often have to be limited due to safety concerns. For example, psychiatric patients might only be allowed to use the flexible safety pins that are um, often given to prison inmates. And by safety pins, I don't mean like clipping pins, I mean like drawing pins. They're the, the flexible ones that are really difficult to use. Craft supplies are limited due to the risks from scissors, paints, and glue. Access to fresh air and nature is likely to be quite limited. Visitors are often restricted. And general psychiatric units typically have a mixed milieu of patients with assorted psychiatric illnesses. It could be frightening to be on a unit with a person who is acutely manic or having a psychotic episode. Other patients who don't understand eating disorders may make comments that are triggering. For example, they might say something like, if I had a body like yours, I wouldn't be suicidal. Diet talk or comments about bodies might occur. Other patients might speculate about medications causing weight gain. Commonly prescribed activities to promote a healthy lifestyle can be triggering for patients with eating disorders. For example, if a group leader on a general psychiatric unit encourages patients to exercise more or cut back on sweets, that can unwittingly reinforce the eating disorder. A big challenge on general psychiatric units is that NG tubes might not be allowed. Therefore, there's little recourse when a patient is refusing to eat or not eating enough unless that patient becomes medically unstable enough to have to be transferred to a medical or pediatric unit. What are some of the potential challenges of treating a patient on a dedicated eating disorder unit? First, there's the possibility of contagion. I think I missed one. Oh, sorry. The potential benefits of being on a specialized eating disorder unit. There are clearly some benefits. There are trained staff who are familiar with how to monitor and support patients with eating disorders. There should be protocols in place to provide medically safe nutritional rehab. There should also be protocols for how to do the vital signs and the weight so that patients don't see their weights. Staff can provide meal support and monitor for eating disorder behaviors. Bathroom support can be provided to prevent purging. Accurate bowel movement records can be kept to try to reduce laxative seeking behavior. And a dedicated dietitian can provide specialized meal plans and education for patients and their families. However, there are challenges even of being on a specialized eating disorder unit. The first one, there's the possibility of contagion and competition. 
Anorexia nervosa thrives on comparison and every new admission to an eating disorder unit creates a cascade of emotions and all the patients already on the unit. Patients inevitably believe, inevitably believe they are the biggest patient on the unit. They might feel unworthy of treatment. They might want to compete to be the sickest or to do their eating disorder well enough to have medical complications. If NG tubes are used, patients might see the NG tube as a sign of success in having an eating disorder that made them sick enough to need a tube. Chronicity is another issue. Patients who are repeatedly hospitalized or hospitalized for long periods of time in eating disorder settings can become more attached to their eating disorders. It can become their identity. Eating disorders also become normalized as patients are surrounded by other people with eating disorders. Some patients become developmentally stunted and lose sight of goals, hobbies, friendships, and other relationships because they're living in an environment where it seems like everybody has an eating disorder. Okay, so what is the perfect environment? Obviously there's not one. And often you won't have the luxury of choosing the type of unit where your patient receives treatment. That can be dictated by their medical condition, insurance considerations, bed availability, and the types of units available in your area. But what I've tried to outline for you is some of the challenges and benefits that can occur with various treatment options for patients with anorexia nervosa who are at risk of death from medical or psychiatric consequences of their illness. So what happens when our patient with severe anorexia nervosa and active or passive suicidal ideation receives treatment at some higher level of care? What is likely to happen? The patient's distress is likely to increase. What was that? The patient's distress is likely to increase. Eating disorders are unlike nearly all conditions you'll treat because the patient is likely to feel ambivalent at best about recovering. When a patient comes to see you with a broken leg, you and the patient will be on the same page about the desired outcome. You both want the patient's leg to be repaired and for the patient to recover. If a patient comes to you with a headache, you and the patient both want the headache to go away. The patient with anorexia has worked hard to become so ill. Their illness might feel like an achievement. Recovery from the eating disorder might feel like a loss. They truly might not have the energy to be invested in living and planning for a future. Eating disorders are maladaptive coping mechanisms for sure, but they can provide some temporary distress reduction for patients. When you put that patient in an environment in which they can't act on their eating disorder behaviors, their emotional distress is going to increase. I often use the analogy of a balloon with a patient. If you squeeze on a balloon and compress part of it, it splooges out in other directions. If we squeeze on a patient's eating disorder by not letting them do the eating disorder behaviors, other impulses are likely to splooge out. For example, if a person is in treatment and is making a concerted effort to reduce eating disorder behaviors, the urge to use substances, self-injure, or to consider suicide is likely to increase. So you think you've done a great thing by getting our hypothetical patient to a safe level of care, and now the patient feels worse. What now? Well, I can't condense everything that happens in treatment into a few slides, but I wanna to try to distill some of the key features of treatment. First, here's the best medication. Food is the best medicine to treat anorexia nervosa and ultimately to treat the suicidal ideation that can accompany it. As we learned from the Minnesota starvation study, low mood and impulsivity can occur secondary to starvation. Often a person's mood improves substantially once they're better nourished. That doesn't mean that the patient does not report feeling physically and emotionally miserable in the process, but the low mood that comes secondary to starvation needs to be treated with food and with a tincture of time. Next treatment, distress reduction and coping skills. 
a common type of therapy and one that is often used in treating eating disorders as well as for patients who are suicidal is DBT. DBT stands for Dialectical Behavioral Therapy and it's a form of cognitive behavioral therapy designed for people who have intense emotional reactions. DBT has four main tenets. They are mindfulness, interpersonal effectiveness, distress tolerance, and emotion regulation. Coping skills. Developing coping skills is a core tenet of DBT, and it's beyond the scope of this talk to do a deeper dive into them. But I do recommend trying to familiarize yourself with the terminology used in DBT because it will help your patients if you speak the language they are learning in therapy. You can reinforce and validate what they're learning as part of their treatment. Much of the work of overcoming an eating disorder, and this often applies for mood disorders as well, is replacing maladaptive coping skills with less destructive ones. For most patients, that doesn't feel like good news at first. When patients are in distress, they understandably want something that feels 100% effective and works immediately. But that's not how coping skills work, unfortunately. The cornerstone of eating disorder treatment, as well as treatment for depression and anxiety, is helping the patient learn to tolerate distress. Often when we encourage patients to use coping skills, they say, I tried them all and they don't work. I tell patients that coping skills are like muscles. The more they use them, the stronger they become. We can all learn to use certain behaviors or cognitive reframing techniques to reduce our distress. I don't wanna live anymore, meds and therapy aren't working. This sometimes feels like the story of my life as a psychiatrist working in inpatient and residential eating disorder settings. People come in for treatment, they can't engage in their eating disorder behaviors while in treatment, so their distress and potentially their suicidal ideation go up. Suddenly, they feel like their meds aren't working. I try to prepare patients for this phenomenon, but the message often doesn't penetrate. Patients feel distress and hope, understandably, that a medication adjustment will make them feel better. Their distress is real. Our ability to reduce that distress with medications is limited. So what is the role for medications? There's definitely a role for meds in treating many of the disorders that are comorbid with eating disorders. However, there are no specific medications approved to treat anorexia nervosa itself. We obviously have many meds that can treat depression though. And I'm gonna go through some medications and talk about how they might be helpful or worrisome choices to use in a person with severe anorexia nervosa and suicidality. Does the patient have the building blocks? One question that often arises is, will meds even be effective in someone who is extremely low body weight? Do they even have enough tryptophan, a precursor to serotonin, to make and modulate neurotransmitters? There was a study by Barbara to look at whether adding tryptophan and other nutritional supplements helped increase the effect of fluoxetine in severely malnourished patients. The study did not demonstrate a benefit to adding tryptophan and other supplements. So here's some practical advice that I use in, in decision-making about whether and when to start medications. If you're going to the beach, wear a swimsuit. If the patient has long-standing mood symptoms or if the mood symptoms predated the eating disorder, I go ahead and add a medication to target mood sooner rather than later. Since it takes several weeks for most antidepressants to start working, if I think we're gonna end up needing an antidepressant anyway, I'd rather go ahead and start it sooner rather than wait. Since there's no magic indicator of when a patient's nutrition might be adequate to make the medication helpful, I'd rather have it on board anyway if I feel certain that it will be needed. If the mood symptoms had their onset around the same time as the eating disorder or seem clearly secondary to the eating disorder, then I hold off on adding a medication to see how the mood changes with weight and nutritional restoration. One caveat is that in extremely malnourished patients with electrolyte abnormalities, QTC prolongation, or other medical issues, I usually don't start a, medical, a medication until the medical issues have been stabilized. As you know, SSRIs and SNRIs are the mainstay of treatment for depression. 
There is a black box warning, as you know, regarding treatment emergent suicidality. So it's important to assess for suicidal ideation before starting a medication, and then make sure the patient will notify you if suicidal ideation develops while they're on the meds. But I think it's important not to undertreat mood symptoms for fear of precipitating suicidal ideation. And SSRIs and SNRIs are a logical first choice. I don't have a favorite SSRI or SNRI. If compliance is an issue, I like fluoxetine due to its long half-life. With all the others, I make a point of emphasizing the importance of medication compliance. SSRI and SNRI withdrawal is probably under-recognized as a significant cause of physical and emotional distress. Missing even one dose of some of these meds can make people feel physically or emotionally terrible. So I make a big point to tell people never to run out of these meds and not to miss doses. Ritazapine is another antidepressant commonly used to treat depression in patients with eating disorders. I like to use mirtazapine because it can help patients sleep. It can cause increased appetite and that can be a good thing or a bad thing. I don't ever try to trick patients by giving a med that's likely to make them hungry. And remember that anorexia is not fundamentally a disorder of appetite. Even if medication increases hunger, patients with anorexia are likely to restrict anyway. So if we're going to consider mirtazapine, I do try to be honest with a patient that it might affect their appetite. So I'd rather have them buy in and have a conversation with me than go look it up on the internet and decide that I've tried to trick them. And remember, there is a black box warning regarding using bupropion on patients with eating disorders due to risk of seizures. Lithium. Lithium has been demonstrated to reduce suicidal ideation. However, I would use lithium with extreme caution in a patient with suicidal ideation and anorexia nervosa. Lithium toxicity could e easily occur in the face of dehydration that might accompany anorexia. Lithium requires blood level monitoring and it can affect thyroid and renal function. I rarely start patients with severe anorexia nervosa on lithium. Atypical antipsychotics can be an appealing choice to help patients with mood symptoms and anorexia nervosa because they often increase appetite and can lead to weight gain. The literature is inconclusive regarding the benefits of atypical antipsychotics in patients with anorexia in reducing cognitive rigidity and eating disorder cognitions. I often see olanzapine used in eating disorder patients. And sometimes I do like to use it to help sleep and the severe anxiety associated with severe anorexia, but I would view its use as short-term. I've seen quite a few patients who were put on olanzapine and then gained a lot of weight and that triggered another round of severe restricting. How about aripiprazole? In this study by to Helioglu, the BMI and core eating disorder cognitions improved in patients with anorexia taking aripiprazole, but depressive symptoms did not. I do use quite a bit of aripiprazole at a very low dose, for example, two milligrams to reduce rigid eating disorder cognition, but the literature doesn't currently support its use to treat depression, specifically in patients with anorexia nervosa. Ketamine. There's not time to go into this study by Keeler in detail, but just know that ketamine can be helpful to provide rapid treatment of depression and amelioration of suicidal ideation. And, a ket and ketamine is being specifically studied in patients with anorexia nervosa. ECT, there's a study by Shilton et al. that shows that ECT is safe and well-tolerated in anorexia nervosa with severe comorbid treatment treatment resistant major depressive disorder and or suicidal risk. TMS, this analysis by Murray showed mixed results with TMS and anorexia nervosa. So let's shift gears now to talk about something very sobering. We are all dedicated to preventing suicide. However, in the eating disorder community, we're starting to talk about when or if it's appropriate to declare that treatment is unlikely to be helpful. At what point do we allow someone to succumb to anorexia? 
Is that suicide or is it a natural progression of the illness? I'd like to introduce the term severe and enduring anorexia nervosa. And I didn't make up this term. This is a term that's used in eating disorder treatment communities. There's no clear <clears throat> consensus on what severe and enduring anorexia is. We know that approximately a quarter of patients with anorexia do not recover or go into sustained remission. And if you work with patients with eating disorders, you're likely to encounter patients who have severe and enduring anorexia nervosa. However, figuring out how to manage their care is difficult. We've talked about involuntary hospitalization in patients with severe eating disorders, but what about the patient who's been severely ill for years? The patient is not actively suicidal, but they continue to engage in behaviors that place them at chronic risk of sudden death. These patients might or might not have the insight into the lethal potential for their illness. What do you do with these type of patients? So here are some factors to consider when making the severe and enduring anorexia diagnosis. Obviously, a person has to have had anorexia nervosa for multiple years in order to be diagnosed, but how many years? There's no consensus. Is it five years, 10 years, 15 years? What if there's been a period of remission followed by a relapse? Does that improve the prognosis? The age of the patient <clears throat> is crucial before making the diagnosis. We know that brains are still developing into a person's 20s, and if the patient's eating disorder had its onset during their teens, it likely affected their developmental trajectory. In addition, they would have been malnourished during adolescence, and they might need additional years to catch up developmentally, both physiologically and psychologically. Loosely, I've heard experts suggest that 30 years old is the youngest that someone should ever be considered to have severe and enduring anorexia nervosa. And finally, it's important that someone <clears throat> has undergone full weight restoration, probably more than once, in order to be classified as having severe and enduring anorexia nervosa. Cognitions and mood often don't improve until a person is fully weight restored and has lived in a weight restored body for months. Even though a person might have been to inpatient or residential treatment several times, if they left treatment or were forced to leave treatment due to insurance deauthorization before they were fully weight restored, they did not have the opportunity to do some physical and emotional healing that can only occur with full weight restoration. So I would not consider that person to have have severe and enduring anorexia nervosa. <clears throat> Excuse me. So here's a spectrum of attitudes regarding um, treatment for this type of patient. And first, I am not here to promote any particular approach. I just want to introduce you to the discussions that are happening among eating disorder professionals. Incidentally, as you probably know, similar discussions are happening with regard to suicide in general. We've moved away from saying that someone committed suicide in favor of saying that somebody died by suicide. This shift in terminology reflects our understanding that sometimes in some circumstances, suicide is a natural outcome of longstanding emotional or physical pain. If we think of eating disorder treatment, viewpoints fall on a spectrum with the most conservative opinion being that forced treatment is always the right thing to do. Even if someone has had treatment numerous times and says they don't want to undergo treatment again, people in the forced treatment camp would still advocate for the patient to be involuntarily hospitalized, tube fed, and forced to undergo treatment. A more moderate approach might be a harm reduction model <clears throat> in which the patient might not be maintaining the weight that you believe to be optimal, but you agree to continue to work with them and not force treatment unless their weight or medical condition falls below certain thresholds. Heading to the right end of our bell curve would be people who believe that palliative care and even hospice can be appropriate for certain patients with anorexia nervosa. Under this model, the patient would be given supportive treatment or comfort measures, but they would not be forced <clears throat> to undergo eating disorder specific treatment, even if their weight or medical status falls below a certain threshold. And then finally, some people advocate the option of medical aid in dying or MAID. I wanna make you aware of a bombshell paper that was published earlier this year. And in this paper, Gaudiani and Yeager point out that quote, 
the majority of potentially terminally illnesses carry with them thoughtfully considered and evidence-based staging criteria that allow patients and clinicians to distinguish mild and likely curable presentations of the disease from irreversible pre-terminal and terminal stages, end quote. That's not the case in anorexia nervosa. The authors point out that we don't expect people with stage four cancer to continue treatment that comes with high, morbidity, with high morbidity if that person decides they are ready to stop treatment. That has historically not been the case with eating disorders. In Gaudiani's highly controversial paper, she and the other authors argue that medical assistance in dying should be offered to some patients with severe and enduring anorexia nervosa. At a certain point, is it inappropriate for us to continue to force treatment on patients? Eating disorder professionals are trying to figure out how to provide treatment that respects a patient's autonomy, even if it means that the person is likely to die. Gaudiani's paper has caused some shockwaves in the eating disorder treatment community, and I'm going to put a couple of references for rebuttal papers at the end of my slides, so you can take a look at those. Should we ever allow someone to succumb to anorexia nervosa? This is a topic that's difficult to discuss, and it tends to bring up a lot of emotions for people, but I put it in this presentation so you would be aware of the ethical issues that people in the eating disorder treatment community are having when we consider eating disorders and lethality. I was tempted to try to find a nice tidy way to wrap up this talk and put a happy spin on it. Humor is one of my favorite defense mechanisms, but I just couldn't find a way to end on a light note. Thank you for taking care of patients with eating disorders. Thank you for trying to prevent suicide and death in this population. And thank you for your attention. I am happy to answer questions now. Thank you so much for this wonderful talk, Dr. Foreman. I also wanted to share that this presentation was done in collaboration with the Hub Behavioral Health Action Organization for Southwestern Connecticut. I'll now go ahead and open up for questions that we received in the Q&A box. Any unanswered questions will still be taken and will be sent via email with responses one week from today by Dr. Foreman. The first question reads, can the same clinical interventions benefit involuntary cancer anorexic case sexic patients? Could you repeat the question? Can the same clinical interventions benefit involuntary cancer anorexics or case sexic patients? I'm not sure I understand. I, I think the person may be wondering about somebody who has cachexia as a result of cancer or some other similar illness. That's a really good question. Uh, and in fact, I was just had a conversation today with one of our consult liaison psychiatrists about how they handle that when somebody has a terrible illness and, and just develops failure to thrive. I'm, I'm not going to give an answer to that question because I don't live in the CL world. And so I don't know if they ever use um, the involuntary hospitalization statute. I think in order to use it, you would have to make an argument that the person has a mental illness. And perhaps in that case, you could say that the person has severe depression that is making them unwilling to eat or continue to engage in treatment, but it gets very, very dicey. I'm fortunate to work in a, a big hospital where we can call in ethicists and get consultation from um, a lot of people to help us when things get really sticky like that. But do remember, though, that that involuntary hospitalization statute is for mental illnesses. Thank you so much, Dr. Foreman. And then they ask, can you spell the websites mentioned that are horrific in regards to glamorizing anorexia? It's That's a good question. You know what? They, the words that I used were pro-ana. So some people call anorexia 
Anna, almost to personalize it like a person, or pro Mia, like bulimia. Um, so if you put in on your search pro Anna or pro Mia, you will come up with sites. I haven't done it in years because I don't want to get cookies on my computer and I don't want to get um, linked to all of those things. So it's been a number of years since I've gone on them, but the kind of things that people will post, they're like little bulletin boards where somebody may go on and say, you know, here's a trick for how you can eat less, put mustard in your water and drink it, or, you know, wear plastic wrapped around you when you go work out or, you know, put salt on your apples all kinds of things. And if you work with patients with eating disorders, you will know that there are countless tricks and methods that they use in order to try to further their eating disorder. Um, so one thing I do with patients at some point in treatment is usually talk to them about their social media and find out if they have been going to pro Anna or pro Mia sites, or if they are following influencers who have eating disorders or who glamorize um, emaciated bodies. And if so, I encourage them while they're in treatment, maybe with the support of a therapist to delete those things from their social media feeds, because the last thing you want is for them to leave treatment and go start scrolling TikTok or Instagram and see all of those potentially triggering images come up. Similarly, sometimes patients themselves have posted images of themselves in emaciated bodies, and maybe they got a lot of positive comments for them. And so you just want to try to help anticipate with patients things that may be triggering in the future so that they're not blindsided. Thank you so much, Dr. Foreman. I'll go ahead and address one more question. Can you discuss your thoughts on the intersection between your talk and the recent position paper of terminal anorexia as a classification? I think the paper was important because I think it advances the conversation um, that we do need to start thinking about how to offer dignity and work with patients who have severe and enduring anorexia, but maybe are not motivated to uh, to continue to try to work toward recovery. I think there were some problems with the paper though, in that they might not have picked the best cases to use to argue that there is such a thing as terminal anorexia. One of the authors of the paper was a patient of Dr. Gaudiani's who did end up um, dying from anorexia. They were together pursuing the medication assisted uh, death. I think they even had the medication, but the patient ended up dying before taking it. So she didn't actually take the pills to die, but the patient felt so strongly that people should have access to it, that she was a posthumous author on the paper. But I think that case in particular um, met with a lot of scrutiny because you could argue that she had never had full treatment. Um, I'm not sure she had ever been fully weight restored. I think there were questions that maybe she hadn't had a full trial of multiple antidepressants and different medications. So unfortunately, I think that the, um, the uh, cases that they chose kind of produced some very easy criticism for their paper. And that may have, um, not fostered the important conversations that we need to continue to have about whether there is a terminal anorexia. Thank you so much, Dr. Foreman. Um, we are have run out of time and I do have unanswered questions that are still here in the Q&A box. What I will remind you is that we will send responses to your questions one week from today, and this presentation recording will be available via the NC Training Center. You will also receive the link to that training recording once it is available. Thank you so much for joining today's presentation. Thank you once again, Dr. Kelly, for your time and for sharing your wealth of knowledge. Thank you all for having me today. Thank you all.